Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, and thank you for joining APQC's April Human Capital Management Webinar, Creating a Culture of Engagement. A few housekeeping items before we get started. We are live tweeting during this webinar, so be sure to join the conversation on Twitter and use the hashtag HCMAPQC. As a reminder, audio is available through your computer speakers or dial-in lines, and all attendee lines are muted. This is the Q&A tool located on the right of your screen. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them here and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and you will receive a copy of the slides as well as the recording in a few days. I would now like to pass the presentation off to Alyssa Tucker, the Human Capital Management Research Program Manager here at APQC. She will introduce the topic and the speaker for today's webinar. Thank you, Maddie, and I'd like to welcome all of our listeners. Thank you for joining us. Well, one of the reasons that I invited today's guest speaker is because I wanted APQC listeners to have the opportunity to hear his message about why involvement of the entire organization, the organization as a whole, so we're talking about leaders, HR professionals, and individual employees, all of them have a crucial role to play uh, in employee engagement. So I'm, I'm very excited for, for listeners to hear um, this message. And I think it's a particularly pertinent message today. Uh, we see in some regions and in some professions, unemployment is low. And organizations are increasingly challenged to retain employees. Then there are industries and regions that are currently experiencing a downturn, and they're looking to keep employees engaged amidst uncertainty, change, and sometimes even, even layoffs. So uh, the responses uh, that were shared in our pre-webinar registrant poll speak to both the current importance of and the present challenges in engaging employees. We saw that roughly three quarters of you said that engaging employees is a high priority priority for organizations today. And 80% said that today employees are moderately engaged or less than moderately engaged at work. So our guest speaker is going to share some great insights into how these challenges can be addressed. So it's my pleasure to introduce Don McPherson. For 20 years, Don has worked with organizations to help accelerate their people to the extraordinary. From his early days at American Express through his 17 years as co-founder of Modern Survey, and now as a partner in Aon's Talent Practice, Don has been passionate about optimizing the workplace and getting employees to reach their performance potential. So please join me in welcoming Don. Thank you, Alyssa, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's my pleasure to be sharing what uh, what I've learned over the past um, oh, 20 years, uh, talking about employee engagement, learning and measuring employee engagement at different organizations. And you heard my bio. I've, I've been in this space for 20 years, 17 with Modern Survey. Um, prior to that, I was at American Express. Uh, but I want to share a little bit about my recent history before we, we move on to the topic at hand. On February 2nd, my business partners and I officially sold Modern Survey to Aon. So we went from being a 40-person organization to working with 72,000 people around the world. So imagine that from a cultural perspective, the changes at our organization, the changes to our roles, etc. Uh, a, a time of dramatic change. So that was on February 2nd. On February 8th, it was announced to the world through a press release that this had actually happened. And that was announced around 9 a.m. on the 8th. So the day after the Super Bowl, if you're in the U.S. and, and a sports fan, uh, that announcement went out. And around 5 p.m. on that same day, I became a father for the first time. So. All of these changes have been going on over the last three months, and it's been amazing, an amazing experience for me. And so I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, if you think you've had a busy quarter, my quarter has been just unbelievably busy and fulfilling to uh, levels that I, I never even thought existed. <laughs> so that's, that's a little bit about my recent history. 
And as Alyssa, as Alyssa said, I am very passionate about this topic of employee engagement. I'm excited to spend the next 35 or 40 minutes talking about how you can create a culture of engagement within your organization. So before I move on from this, you have my contact information here. If you're on LinkedIn and you're active on social media, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, follow me on Twitter, you can follow Modern Survey and read our, our content on employee engagement as well. So that's my, my ask. Let's talk about Modern Survey's mission. And this is also the, the mission of the Aon Global Employee Engagement Practice. Um, they actually adopted our mission, which is accelerating people to the extraordinary. And we believe that every employee has some extraordinary in them. And it's up to us as leaders, as HR professionals, to close the gap between current performance and performance potential. And the more we can close that gap, the more our organization is going to perform at, at a peak a level. So how do we do it? Well, we do it through a suite of solutions that measures the employee experience, from onboarding effectiveness through the exit. And these are the five solutions that we have um, to offer Spark measures onboarding effectiveness, M Thrive is our employee engagement solution, M Perform measures performance, M360 is a leadership effectiveness tool, and M Exit measures opinions for, from people who are leaving the organization. All of these solutions fit on top of a platform called Heat, which is our data analytics and reporting tool. So we integrate all of this information, external data as well, to help your organization understand what the employee experience is like. So that's what, uh, that's how we help our clients accelerate to the extraordinary. Let's get into the topic at hand, which is employee engagement. And if we are going to have a culture of engagement, it's really, really important that every employee knows what employee engagement is. It's unfair for us to expect something from employees that they don't even know what it is. And so creating a culture of engagement starts with having a definition for what engagement is. And our definition is that employees are psychologically invested. So they need to have a high level of psychological investment in the organization. And when you have that psychological investment, that's when people will work to help the organization reach its goals. They'll provide that extra discretionary effort, that, that little extra oomph that's going to get the organization uh, to, to meet its goals. And you have to have it. You have to have this understanding of what engagement is if you're going to get people to, under, to, to own their own engagement. And we'll talk about what owning their own engagement is. Uh, and so that's my challenge to you is if you want this culture of engagement, start with a definition and educate people in your organization around what engagement is. And you can take our definition, you can modify our definition, or come up with your own definition. But it's really important if you want people to to be engaged that they know what engagement is. So that's a great launching off point for our first poll question. And, uh, and if you want to go ahead and, and execute the poll question, it's pretty simple. Uh, we're asking you, do most people at your organization understand the concept of employee engagement? You can answer one of these five uh, options here. Do you strongly agree with that statement? Agree, neither agree nor disagree disagree or strongly disagree. So we'll give you oh, a few seconds to ponder that question and then we'll share the results with you. And I'll just let our, um, uh, our team uh, execute the, uh, the results uh, when we have enough responses. All right, so what do we got? 48% saying they agree. That's fantastic. That's a little bit higher than I would have expected. So it's about half and half. Half are saying agree or strongly agree. The other half are kind of uh, neither agree nor disagree. Well, I have some data for you, and I'm going to share it in, uh, in a little bit around what we've found the understanding of employee engagement is at, uh, across the U.S. workforce. 
Um, but before we do that, let's look at our model. Uh, our model for measuring engagement, um, this is what we, we use with our clients, is, uh, and, and this is how we think about peak performance occurring. So uh, engagement is important, and we, we categorize engagement as performance potential. So the more engaged your workforce is, the more your employees are able to work toward their performance potential. But that's not the only thing that your organization needs to succeed. Um, you also have to have capable employees who know uh, where to apply their efforts and energy. So that would be the direction piece. We say that peak performance occurs at the intersection of engagement, capabilities, and direction. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're going into surgery. And it's really important that that surgeon is engaged, right? I think we can all agree on that. Well, I can tell you that if I was a surgeon, I'd probably be pretty engaged. I can also tell you that I'm completely incapable of doing the job. So you don't want me to perform your surgery. You want uh, an engaged surgeon who is capable of doing the job. But the last piece is the, the, the direction piece. So if you go in for appendicitis, and you're going to have your appendix removed, and the surgeon is told that uh, he or she needs to operate on your ankle, you're probably not going to have a peak uh, performance type situation there. So these three things have to coincide. They have to intersect in order for peak performance to occur. And this is what we measure when we're working with the client to help them understand how their organization, the health of their organization, or how their organization is uh, optimized to perform. When you've, get, when you've got all three of these things working together, that's when you're able to achieve the business results that you want. And get satisfied loyal customers, you're going to grow, um, you're going to get the business performance that you want, and then you'll be able to reinvest into your employees again. So how are we doing? And as a nation, this is a study that Modern Survey has conducted uh, every six months for the past seven or eight years, and as a nation, in the U.S., we're not doing that great. In fact, only about one in eight employees are fully engaged. 13% of the U.S. workforce is fully engaged. And on the other side of things, 22%. So almost one in four employees is disengaged. To give you some further context, from spring 2015, the fully engaged number dropped from 14%, the disengaged number dropped from 23%. So we haven't experienced a ton of movement over the last year. However, the worst we have seen in terms of full engagement was 8%. That was a few years ago, and that was kind of coming out of the recession. It was really tough. Unemployment was still fairly high. A lot of organizations had employees doing multiple jobs, um, really understaffed in a lot of ways. On, in terms of disengagement, we have seen it as high as 32%. So while these numbers might seem really dismal, we've seen even worse. But what we can all agree on is that if your organization is going to reach its goals, you have to be better than average because this is really average. This is what the U.S. workforce looks like, the average workplace. And you've probably, you know, if you've been shopping or, you know, interacting with uh, different organizations as a customer, you've probably seen a lot of under-engaged and disengaged employees. Hopefully that that's, that's not the case at your organization, but, um, but it is unfortunately the case at, at most organizations in the United States. So we can agree that it's fairly dismal, but I've got news for you. At your organization, it doesn't need to be that way. So let's talk about what is required in order to create a culture of engagement. First of all, every employee needs to know what the concept of engagement is and what drives engagement. They need to know what the responsibility for owning their own engagement is. And last, they take responsibility for driving engagement for those team members around them. So this is not something that falls solely on the shoulders of a manager or a leadership team. Engagement is one of those things that is owned by the entire organization. 
Now, we, we conducted a study a couple of years ago. We asked people a very simple question. Do you understand the concept of employee engagement? And if somebody said yes, we asked them a follow-up question. Who owns engagement? And this is what we found. We found that about 12% said senior leaders own engagement. 39% said managers own engagement. And then 17% said employees. I own my own engagement. I'm chiefly responsible, primarily responsible for engagement. And then the remaining one-third or so said engagement is owned by all three of these groups equally. And that's really our position. Is and, and, and it runs contrary to conventional wisdom, by the way. Conventional wisdom says engagement is owned by the manager. And I want you to really shift your thinking on that. There are things that the organization needs to do to make engagement possible. There are things that leaders need to do to drive engagement. And ultimately, employees need to own their own engagement if you're going to have a culture of engagement. So I want you to keep that in mind as we're talking about what's required for creating this culture of engagement. And that's a great jumping off point for what we're going to talk about uh, in terms of what the organization needs to do. Now, the organization is the gateway. They make engagement possible. And the organization is the entity, but the entity actually is driven a lot by or led by senior leadership. So I don't necessarily want to use those two terms synonymously, organization and, and senior leadership, but senior leadership is really, really important to, to making engagement happen as well. The first thing that has to happen in order for engagement to be possible is people need to be paid fairly. You know, this is just kind of one of those things that has to be overcome. You double their pay, you pay them twice what they're worth, you're not going to get a whole lot more sustainable engagement, but you need to find that sweet spot. Underpay them, they'll be disengaged. Overpay them, they'll become entitled to that payment and, and expect it and not necessarily provide extra effort. For the most part, engagement is not, or compensation is not our engagement issue. 58% of the U.S. workforce is saying that, you know what, my compensation is pretty competitive in our industry. And if you add in the neutral responses, it's about 80%. So four out of five people really believe that they're paid about uh, what they're worth. And my position on this is pretty much always the organization knows whether or not they're paying fa fairly. You know, most organizations of a certain size do compensation studies and they have a pretty good idea of what fair pay is. Now, if employees have a different perception. It's often an issue of, of communication and not necessarily an issue of what they're truly paid. And so that's one of the ways in which you can overcome this barrier if you have it. But for most organizations, it is not the barrier to, to making engagement happen. The second thing that the organization needs to do is create an environment of trust. And I like to show this slide because it shows if you're fully engaged, you almost always trust your senior management and your direct manager. Whereas if you're disengaged, there's an only, only an 8% chance that you trust your senior management. And only a 35% chance that you trust your direct manager. Now think about that. Think about how remarkable that difference is. And if I was to tell you that across the U.S. workforce, only about 50% of all employees say they trust their senior management. That would help you understand how problematic trust is in many of our organizations. So what do you do about it? Well, there are a handful of things that you need to do. First of all, if you're not telling the truth, start telling the truth. You have to rebuild trust. And in most organizations, that's not the case. The, another thing that you can consider doing is honoring your commitments. So if you make a commitment to employees, you actually have to follow through with it. And one of the great pieces, 
of advice that I got from a mentor of mine is nobody cares about your intentions. No one cares about your intentions other than you. People care about your actions. So if you don't honor commitment and you have all sorts of excuses, you're the only one who cares about the excuse. The person on the other end of the conversation really doesn't care about the excuse. They care about your action, which is you didn't honor the commitment. And then a third and much more subtle way of creating an environment of trust, show up on time. When you've got a meeting and you show up five, ten minutes late to the meeting, that really shows people that you matter as much as the person showing up late. So show up on time. And there are a, a, a number of other things that you can do to create an environment of trust, but those are three things to get you started. Lots of other things, and, and you know, your employee survey ought to be diagnosing what the environment is like around trust and trustworthiness throughout the organization. But these, these data points are remarkable in terms of showing the correlation between engagement and trust. The next thing that I'm going to talk about is what extraordinary companies do. So we're talking about what the organization needs to do to make engagement possible. We found that there are five people practices that extraordinary organizations put in place. Or extraordinary organizations, they measure quality and they share the results with, with employees, not just a quality department, but they're sharing the results across the enterprise. They also measure customer satisfaction and they're sharing the results across the enterprise there as well. They train employees on a regular basis, they provide uh, regular performance feedback, and then last they have a set of values that are throughout the organization. So these five things, when, it, when an individual says, my organization does these five things, we categorize them as working for an extraordinary company. If you say no to one or more of these things, we say, you know, you're working for one of those other companies, one of those non-extraordinary companies. And what we found is extraordinary companies have significantly higher levels of engagement and far less levels of disengagement. In fact, if you can say yes to all five of those things, you're almost five times more likely to be fully engaged and about one-fifth to one-sixth as likely to be disengaged. Now think about those five things, measuring customer satisfaction and quality, training employees, providing performance feedback, and having values that are known and understood. Most organizations of a certain size, and I'd say over 100 employees, should be doing all five of those things or have plans in place to do all five of those things. So those should be no-brainers. People should be answering those things positively at most organizations. Oftentimes I'm asked, which of the five is most important? And it's a great question. I like answering that question because the results are stunning. Values of those five are most important. Having a set of values that are known and understood. And this is the third and final thing that a, an organization needs to do to make engagement possible. You have to have a set of that are known and understood throughout the organization to have high levels of engagement. And we found that those people who say, no, my organization doesn't have a set of values that are known and understood, only one in 150 of them were fully engaged. Engagement, high levels of engagement or fully engaged employees are non-existent or are next to non-existent in organizations that don't have values. So think about it. What organization doesn't have values? Well, we all kind of have values regardless of whether they're stated or not. And the values are not necessarily the things that are written on a badge. And I like to use Enron as an example of that. Enron had values. Their, their four stated values were respect, integrity, communication, and excellence. But if you know anything about that organization, and that's a, an example that's over a decade old, but most of us on this webinar are going to remember what happened to Enron. They imploded. And the values that their senior leadership team and their leaders throughout the organization demonstrated were not 
the values that I stated. They were a different set of values. And that's why I say every organization has value, what values, whether they're stated or unstated. And people watch their leadership to truly understand what the organization values. So, in summary, the organization makes engagement possible. They're the gateway. And they do it by paying fairly, creating an environment of trust, and having values that are known and understood. Without these things, it doesn't matter how good your managers are, how effectively you set expectations around how employees are going to own their own engagement. It's going to be really challenging for you to have a culture of engagement. So that's what the organization needs to do. It's a great jumping off point for our second poll question. We're going to open it up in a moment here. And it's um, pretty simple. Leaders at my organization have a clear understanding of what drives engagement. So you've got five choices again, strongly agree to strongly disagree. We'll leave it open for 15, 20 seconds till the majority of you have an opportunity to vote and then we'll share the results with you and then we'll get into what is leadership's role. So whenever we've got enough responses, go ahead and and um, share the data and we'll, we'll examine the data and then uh, move on from there. All right, so this is kind of interesting. 2% are strongly agreeing and we've got over 100 people on the webinar, so only a couple of you are, are strongly agreeing that this is the case. 22% are agreeing, the rest uh, with almost half in the disagree bucket, 55% uh, disagree. So this is really interesting. And then if you're one of those disagree or strongly disagree folks and you're in a leadership position or an HR position, you can do an extraordinary job of educating around what does drive engagement. So let's flip back to uh, the PowerPoint and let's look at what leadership's role is. Leaders really drive engagement. And notice I'm saying leaders and I'm using that term very intentionally. Because if you look at what these drivers of engagement are, and they're rank ordered in terms of importance or the strength of the driver. I'm using leader because I want to stay away from manager. Uh, obviously, because of the nature of these drivers, senior leadership is important. But direct managers or direct leaders are important as well. And you know what? Individual contributors are too. They can drive engagement just as effectively as a manager might be able to or somebody in a senior leadership position. So let's look at these drivers of engagement. Number one, the, the strongest driver of engagement according to the fall research is that the organization is headed in the right direction. People want to know that their organization has a future. If the organization has a future, very likely we as individual employees have a future as well. The second one is interesting because we normally don't see personal accomplishment showing up this strong. Normally it's in the fourth or fifth position, so that's kind of an interesting finding. It shows a sincere interest in employee well-being. I can grow and develop in my organization and I have confidence in the future of my organization. And another anomaly is that our values guide how people behave. Normally that, that would be further down the list, but it is uh, showing up here as the sixth strongest, strongest driver. Notice that fair pay is missing, so that shows up around the eighth or ninth position. But if you think about what these drivers are and who owns these drivers, number one, number three, and number five are normally owned by the senior leadership team. Number four and number two are primarily owned by the direct manager. But I, as an individual contributor, I can help pe fill people with a, a sense of personal accomplishment, and I can help people grow and develop, too, especially at the organization if I'm an individual contributor, especially if I'm a veteran employee. So these are the things that drive engagement, and it's really important that your leadership team and all employees know what these drivers are and know how to use these drivers to get the most out of uh, employees, their direct reports, their, their team, their teammates, etc. We're going to look at these drivers, a few of these drivers, in 
a little bit more detail and I'll share some results uh, for how these things have trended over the years uh, that we've been conducting this study. But I, again, I really want you to understand that we are flying in the face of conventional wisdom. The driving engagement is not something that is owned solely by the manager. It's a shared responsibility, shared between senior leaders, direct managers, and even individual contributors can can uh, participate in, in owning these drivers and using these drivers to get the best out of other people at the organization. So let's look at confidence in the organization. And for those of you and us who have been in the workforce uh, over the last five or six years, you probably remember some of these very dark periods that we had post-recession. And you can see how much more confident people are in their organization's future less than half of the entire U.S. workforce in the fall of 2011, spring 2012, spring 2013, less than half felt confidence that their organization was headed in the right direction. Now it's almost two-thirds of employees, and that's fantastic. And if you look around, it's a really tight labor market. Unemployment is under 5%. If you're educated and over 25, so you have a college degree and you're over 25. Unemployment is around 25 maybe 2%. So there is a renewed sense of confidence uh, in our organizations and in our institutions, uh, most institutions anyway. But if we want to build confidence in our organizations, what can we do? Well, your senior leadership team needs to communicate the health of the organization financially, from an engagement perspective, and where the organization is going, and last but certainly not least, how the organization is going to get there. What's the plan for getting there? That's how you build engagement. And then your leaders below the senior leadership team need to support that message. And the extent to which they can say, okay, this is where we are, this is where we're going, and here are how you contribute as a team and as an individual employee to getting us there. That's how you build confidence in the organization. And even those organizations that have struggled, when they have great leaders who are communicating what the future vision is and the pathway to get there, they can still have high levels of confidence in the organization. It's where an organization restricts information uh, that people start to have their confidence wane, and that's, that's bad news. So the frequency of communication from senior leaders and down to managers is critical here. The second strongest driver is, is having a sense of personal accomplishment, and you can see how things spiked a little over a year ago in fall of 2014, in spring 2015, almost 80% of the U.S. workforce felt this sense of personal accomplishment. We've dropped back down to historic levels, around 72%. But what can you do as a leader of an organization to fill people with a sense of personal accomplishment? Well, I'll give you two examples real quickly. First of all, focus on outcomes, not on tasks. So I like to use the example of a janitor. An average manager sees a janitor as the person who empties the garbage and mops the floors. That's the task. But a great manager, a great leader will say, you know what? You are the person who keeps us safe and healthy. Now, who do you want to work for? Do you want to work for the, the person who says, you empty the garbage and mop the floor, or you're the person who keeps us safe and healthy? Now, if you think about all of the jobs in your organization, it need, they need to be related to an outcome. And when you think about outcomes and you recognize people for those outcomes, they're going to get a greater sense of personal accomplishment in their role. The second thing is when you have conversations with your employees around what fills them with a sense of personal accomplishment, it may be the case that somebody who's been with the organization a long time doesn't get a great sense of personal accomplishment around the work that they do. And that's suboptimal. But there are still things that you can do. So I'll give you an example. If you have one of those employees who doesn't get that sense of personal accomplishment at work, you can assign them a mentee and have them mentor somebody. And they ought to be able to get a sense of personal accomplishment on you know, helping that person develop. Or you can give them an opportunity to realize their sense of personal accomplishment outside of work. 
So for example, I've got an employee and she likes to volunteer for Meals on Wheels. Well, if I gave her one afternoon a month or one lunchtime a month where she can go out, spend a couple of hours delivering Meals on Wheels, she's going to come back a re-energized employee and get that sense of personal accomplishment fix that she needs and probably be a better employee. So those are a couple of examples. Uh, the last one we're going to look at at in terms of driving engagement is growth and development. And this is key. Normally it shows up as the second strongest driver. It's not showing up as the second strongest driver now. It's number four. Uh, but it's key for your high potential employees and your younger employees. They will often trade growth and development for pay, for um, confidence in the organization, and for, for other of, uh, of the drivers. If they know that they have high growth potential, this is something that they're going to gravitate toward. And you're, you're going to need to know who these folks are and, and how important growth and development is for them. But you can see how the data have, have risen over the years, over the last four or five years, from 43% favorable to 59% favorable. And I'll give you one tip for elevating sense of growth and development at the organization. If you can have your leaders have conversations with each of their direct reports once a month around where people want to go in their careers and how they're going to get there. And how you can coach them, guide them, or maybe, maybe even give them a boost to reaching their, their growth and development um, goals. I have a, a friend who does this on a on a monthly basis, everybody in his organization is uh, having a conversation about growth and development every month with their manager. And the results are remarkable. You may not have that growth and development goal for that employee, but if you manage them out of the organization in a manageable way, it can work very well for you because you will be able to recruit a replacement in no time flat. And then you're also able to manage that employee out of the organization versus being surprised and getting a two weeks notice and saying, you know what, I wasn't getting the growth and development opportunities and this company over here, they're giving it for, to me. So that's, that's an optimal situation where you're having those conversations that frequently, but it is a best practice and if you can do that in your organization, you're going to have a lot of highly motivated people, particularly your high potentials and your uh, younger employees. All right, so leaders drive engagement. And I shared with you some of the drivers of engagement and some of the ways in which uh, you can influence those drivers of engagement. Let's talk about what the employee's responsibility is because you cannot have a culture of engagement until employees know what engagement is and that they have a responsibility for their engagement. And I just want to share a quote, uh, one of the, I think, most important quotes uh, that I've ever re read, and it's from a guy by the name of Viktor Frankl, and it's, the book is Man's Search for Meaning. It was written in the 50s. But think about this quote for a moment. Everything can be taken from someone, but one thing, the freedom to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, the freedom to choose one's own way. Wow, that's powerful, right? Now, it's even more powerful when you realize that Viktor Frankl survived the Holocaust, and he wrote these words post-Holocaust. He lost every member of his family with the exception of one during the Holocaust, and he still could write these things. And if more of our employees understand that the way they show up, their attitudes, their engagement level is a choice and they choose it, whether they are conscious of that choice or unconscious of that choice. We remove a significant barrier to getting people to own their own engagement. So I'm going to walk you through four steps to get people to own their own engagement. And the first is setting expectations. So ask yourself this. At my organization, we set expectations in the interview process around how people show up for work. Yes or no? At Modern Survey, what we've done over the last four or five years is explicitly stated in all candidate interviews, 
we expect people to bring their best to work every day. If that's not you, that's okay, but this isn't the right place for you. And the body language of those candidates is remarkable. Somebody who is the right performer, they're going to lean in, they want to know more about this. Okay, everybody is going to bring their best to work here? Tell me more. But the wrong candidates, they kind of lean back like, whoa, what do you mean? No, no, you are responsible for engaging me. And you can see in a fraction of a moment whether that person is the right person or not. Whether they have what it takes to bring their best on a regular basis and whether or not they're going to choose. So this is something that you can do starting tomorrow at your organization. Set that explicit expectation. This is what engagement is. This is what we expect. People are expected to bring their best to work every day. And if that's not you, forget about it. This isn't the right place for you. The second is build a knowledge base around what engagement is. So the first poll question we asked, does your, do people in the organization have an understanding of the concept of employee engagement? And most people said, yes, they do. But the fact of the matter is, when we ask people, do you know what engagement is, yes or no, 50% self-identify yes. Now, if they're self-identifying yes, that means a bunch of them are probably saying yes that don't really know what it is. And among people who manage other people, it's only 65%. So if that's inflated, maybe it's 55 in actuality or 60%. It means 45 or 40% 40 of our managers don't know what engagement is. If you're an HR professional, if, if you're a leader at an organization, you can shift this. You can help people understand what engagement is and what their, their role in owning their own engagement is. That's a key, key element to this. Third is build awareness. And what we've done is, nope, I think I skipped a, a slide here. Um, I'm actually going to go forward. In terms of building awareness, uh, we have developed a survey, and you can take it. Go to modernsurvey.com. You can take our survey. It's in the middle of the screen there. How engaged are you at work? And one of the things that we've done is for our clients, we have um, helped them with creating individual reports. So when an individual employee has completed their survey, we say, do you want to see how engaged you are and how that compares against an aggregate of all your employees? And if they say yes, they get this report. And it shows them how engaged they are, and it gives them tips for what they can do to elevate their own engagement. So if you're interested in seeing that, go to modernsurvey.com, take that survey, and, uh, and you'll see how that works. But building awareness around how, engagement, how engaged people are is an important mirror to show and, and put in front of employees. The last is to have one-on-one -on -one discussions, and preparing your managers to have those one-on-one -on -one discussions is critical. And we've developed a tool called Engagement Preferences Interview Questions. And it's a document that managers can share with employees and say, how do you want to be recognized? What fills you with a sense of personal accomplishment? What career development aspirations and goals do you have? So if you're interested in this Engagement Preferences document or interview questions, send me an email. Ask me, just put in the title line, Preferences, and I'll send this document to you. But it is an important facilitator or tool for getting managers and leaders to have conversations around what engagement is and what people want in terms of the drivers of engagement. Uh, it, 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 doing this will promote conversations within the organization that never occurred before. So very quickly I'm going to touch on the role of human resources because a lot of uh, the audience is going to be in the HR role and HR does not own, own engagement, but you can be a catalyst. You can build a business case for an engaged workforce. You can own or be the fiduciary of the engagement survey. Well, that's different than owning engagement, by the way. And you can train and educate leaders and employees around why engagement is important, what engagement is, how to engage people, how to use the drivers of engagement, etc. And the last piece is holding leaders accountable. And we don't expect you to walk around and say, you know, you need to do this to your managers or you need to do that. But when you do your engagement survey, you can audit what is being done from an action planning perspective. And you can coach and guide the leaders who are having challenges following up with the survey. I can tell you that 
failure to follow up on the survey is uh, probably the place where um, most organizations fail uh, th with their engagement initiatives. So this is the great place for launching the third and final poll question, and it's pretty simple. My organization has a plan for creating a more engaged workplace, and we're almost done, I promise. I'll share the results, and then I'm going to walk you through uh, what your plan can be. So go ahead and, and vote on this, and we'll give you about 15, 20 seconds, and then we'll share the results with you. You can tell that I'm very passionate about this topic, and, and so uh, I hope that it's coming through uh, over the webinar here. Uh, I just love talking about this and helping organizations uh, create this culture of engagement. So let's what we, see what we've got here. All right, so 37% of you are agreeing or strongly agreeing. Most of you, the vast majority, um, don't have a plan in place. So let's, let's go back to the PowerPoint and let's walk you through a three-year plan. So this is assuming that you're starting from, you've, you've not done a survey before, um, and you want to create a, a plan for creating this culture of engagement. The first thing that you do is you, you measure how engaged your organization is. You, you get a baseline, and then your senior leaders, they have to follow up on the results of the survey. Otherwise, like, it's step, like stepping on a scale and not exercising or changing your diet and expecting something to, to happen. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You have to have activity in order for uh, anything to change within the organization. So that's year one. Year two you're going to want to measure engagement again, uh, and then you're going to want to roll the results out a little further in the organization or down a little bit lower within the organization to, to mid-level leaders. By year three, every employee, so that you've been in the background doing education, setting those expectations, building knowledge around what engagement is, by year three, every employee in the organization knows what engagement is, knows what their role is in owning their own engagement, knows what the drivers of engagement are, and knows how to use those engagement, those drivers to, to engage other people within the organization. If you do this and your organization is kind of small to mid size, I'd say, you know, under 2,000 employees, you can create a culture of engagement where every employee knows what engagement is and knows how to use those drivers in three years. If you're a bigger organization, mid-sized organization, maybe it's a five-year plan, and if you're a huge behemoth, tens of thousands of employees, it's probably around seven years. So that's it. That's how you put the plan in place. And if you do these things, you can achieve incredible, absolutely incredible results. So if you have questions around any of this, you want um, the asset that I had mentioned to you or any of the research, please feel free to reach out to me uh, at don.macpherson at aonhewitt.com and I'm happy to send you the engagement preferences guide uh, or any of the other materials that I referenced today. So with that, I think we have questions and hopefully answers and I'll turn it over to our, our team to filter through the questions. Sure. Well, this is Alyssa Tucker, and I just want to thank you, Don. Uh, your passion definitely came through, and I really appreciate how you were able to give us such you know, clear directive and, and really practical um, guidance that our listeners can really take and, and start applying at their organization. So just a big thank you for, for sharing all of your, your expertise. And I would like to encourage our, our listeners, if uh, you haven't submitted your questions yet, please go ahead and use the GoTo uh, chat feature to submit questions for Don. Don, we already do have some questions, so you can go ahead and, and jump right in. Um, early in the webinar, um, you talked about uh, the model for uh, employee engagement, um, and part of that was a part of that motto was capability. Um, and someone, one of our listeners wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about the importance of, of capability and what you mean by that. Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, by the way, I just checked my phone and a bunch of you connected with me on LinkedIn already, so thank you for that. I, I encourage others, if you're interested in this kind of topic, uh, to do that as well. 
the question is around capabilities, and I'll address direction too because they're they're very important. So we understand what engagement is, and I talked about what the drivers of engagement are. Um, capabilities are things that are in place um, to help and enable employees to perform. And when we think about capabilities, we're thinking about five different things. We want to know if people have the tools and resources to do their job. Are they trained effectively? Do they work effectively as a team? So within their team and between teams, we want to make sure that employees are involved in decisions that affect them. And we want to make sure that there's a performance management process or feedback loop in place in order for uh, in order for employees to succeed. So those would be the five dimensions of of capabilities. Again, uh, training and uh, tools and resources, training, teamwork, employee involvement, and performance management. When it comes to direction, again, it's five dimensions, and those break down like this: management communication is one of those critical dimensions. Uh, focus on the customer, so uh, customer satisfaction or, or customer care. Quality emphasis, having a set of, of goals that the organization is, is trying to achieve. And then the last is having values that are known and understood. So those are the five dimensions of uh, both capabilities and five dimensions of direction. Excellent. Thank you very much, Don. Our next question uh, is a listener asking if there is a metric that would show the value of employee engagement to management. So they're really looking, how do you build that business case to management? Uh, to, you know, that engagement is something that they should care about and invest in. Is there any kind of met metric or numeric evidence that one might be able to present? Yeah, there are a bunch. And if you're interested in a white paper around the business case, uh, for engagement, send me an email. I'll send you that white paper. But I will uh, state this. I'll state a couple of examples of data um, that can help you make the business case. Um, number one, a fully engaged employee is two and a half times more likely to um, exceed their their performance goals than a, a, a non-fully engaged employee. So that's the performance end of things. Um, Customer satisfaction is higher in organizations that have higher levels of employee engagement. Uh, one study found that in a retail environment, a improvement of one-tenth of one percent on employee engagement equated to $100,000 in uh, store profitability. So that means, and this is a big retail chain, huge retail chain. Uh, that means if employee engagement went up 1%, that meant a million dollars per store. Now, this is a huge, huge change. So but, but they were able to, to create the relationship between engagement, customer satisfaction, and then final performance. So in this white paper, I've got, uh, got instances of, of additional data outside of the two that I've mentioned there. Thank you. And as you are giving uh, your response, we got a question in asking, and I'm I'm going to ask it just in case you have additional information. And it was requesting if you have any data on the ROI of engagement. Um, if you've already answered it, that's fine. But if there's something more there, uh, feel free to to share. Yeah, I would say the same white paper. If you're interested in that, uh, we've got a lot of information. Okay. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, and then we may need to s go back in the slides, um, but uh, the one listener had a question about one of the charts that you had, and it was on um, the driver, uh, the chart on the driver called personal accomplishment. Yes, perfect. Um, and this listener was wondering why, if you had any opinions on why the spring 2012 um, feelings of personal accomplishment were just as low for the most part as they are today in 2015. Any theories there? Or more than a theory, maybe you know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's actually kind of an interesting question. That, um, I, think, I think actually well, what I would speculate is that um, the 72%, 71% is the natural state of things. 
the the anomaly is the 79%. So I'm curious around why it spiked to 79%. And I really don't know. I don't have an understanding. And what I can tell you is that's a significant difference. So we're talking about thousands of responses here. And you know, anything over two points or three points is a huge swing. So seeing it rise five percentage points from 74 to 79 percent and then drop back down seven percentage points, those are huge shifts. I really don't know. I don't have a hypothesis as to why they spiked there and, and have since dropped. But it's a, it's a great question. Yeah, it certainly is very interesting. Well, well thanks for, for giving us your, your thoughts initially on that question. Um, and then I have another question, and this listener says that they understand if you can't answer this question, um, but they're wondering if you would be able to give any examples of companies, you know, that are leading in the marketplace in terms of en engagement, you know, um, are there company names that you might be able to share, maybe not even from your work, but just that you happen to know from popular press that do a really good job of engaging their employees? Well, yeah, I mean, y there are lots of examples. Um, you can hear about Google and Facebook and some of these high-tech organizations where employee engagement is central to their survival. I mean, if you don't have an engaged workforce at these organizations, you can forget about forget about it because you're not going to retain employees and think about San Francisco right now and and the desire to recruit high-tech employees. Uh, it's, a, it's just an incredibly fierce marketplace and so that's um, that's just an ecosystem there that's that's quite remarkable, quite competitive and I've been on the campus of Google a couple of times and it's really kind of a wild place. You've got all sorts of what I would call entitlements or uh, hygiene type things like free food and free haircuts and um, you know ping pong tables and volleyball nets and it's it's truly a, an experience and they've done a great job of of creating an experience for their employees um, they also are printing money so it's really challenging for a lot of our organizations uh, to to kind of compete with that sort of environment. But I'll give another example, and it's a client of ours. They're, they're a smaller organization, about seven, 800 employees, and they have, um, they're in, in the restaurant business. So what they do is reclaim oil from restaurants and recycle the oil and use it for energy. And they've done an amazing job of getting their leadership team in alignment so they're doing all of the things to create engagement, make engagement possible. They communicate very, very frequently with employees. They're measuring engagement very frequently, sharing the results. It's an incredibly transparent organization. And then they have leaders who uh, are driving engagement and it's down to the end of the level that, that I've talked about here. And they're doing all of the things around um, getting the individual employee to own their own engagement as well, including setting the expectations. And their turnover rates are probably a third of what um, their competing organizations, their competing organizations in their industry are. So they've done a remarkable job of that. And I'll use a couple of other examples that are very, very aspirational. So I often ask people, do you think it's possible to get every employee fully engaged? And most people would say no. And that was my kind of response. Um, but then I learned about two organizations in a little bit more depth, uh, the Navy SEALs and the Blue Angels. The Blue Angels are the people who fly those um, planes and they kind of use, uh, they do these airplane shows. And you know, I heard one of the Blue Angels, retired Blue Angel, talk about it. And it turns out that at points of the, the show, the planes are 18 inches apart from each other. So they're flying through the sky, you know, hundreds of miles an hour, 18 inches apart from each other. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want a moderately engaged person next to me flying that plane. So they've done an incredible job of making sure that people are fully engaged. Again, they have incredible resources, though. But it is possible, and it's aspirational.
And the bottom line is, you need to make sure that your organization is not one of these organizations with 13% fully engaged employees. You want to move toward that 26, 30% full, full engagement and maybe another 40, 45% moderately engaged. That's kind of the sweet spot for most organizations because we're not going to compete with sales, the Blue Angels, Google, and, and Facebook. It's, uh, most organizations don't have the resources. Thank you, Don. Thank you for answering that, that last question that our listeners had. And we are out of time, so I just want to thank you again, Don. And I'm going to turn things over to Maddie, who's going to close out the webinar for us. Thank you, Alyssa, and thank you again, Don, for that great presentation. I think listeners really enjoyed it. I just want to close out the webinar here with a few reminders. You will receive an email within a few days with links to both the recording and the slide deck. I know a lot of people have been asking about that via chat. Also, we have a process conference coming up in October, and this is centered around anything process improvement related to your organization. I think you'd find it really interesting. And there are already some breakouts focused around HR transformation, employee engagement, as well as leadership for millennials. So be sure to check that out. And if you'd like to learn more about employee engagement, feel free to browse our knowledge base or check out these links. If you have any questions for Alyssa, there's her contact information there. And check out our expertise page for up-to-date information about research, webinars, and more. And connect with us on social. I hope everyone has a great day. Don't forget to take the post-webinar satisfaction survey. And thanks for joining.